Welcome to Tough Talk. I'm your host, Paul Terrace, and today, as my guest, is Rick Ector. He's a gun rights advocate. He runs Legally Armed in Detroit, and he in, he's the 2016 Second Amendment Foundation Defender of Liberty winner. Welcome, Rick. Hey, welcome, Paul. Thank you so very much for having me on the show. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Um, I want to get into the issue of uh, gun rights and gun laws, but I also want to take first a uh, look back at uh, maybe the history mm -hmm. a little bit. And what I found, and I think it's kind of shameful that it isn't being taught in, in school, is the Dr. ASEAN sweet case. Yes, yes, yes. I think that's just so important on so many levels. Uh, do you want to tell us a, a little bit about that case? Sure. Um, this is a story that was set in uh, Detroit back in the mid-20s, approximately 1925. And in Detroit during that era, the demographics were a little different than they are today. Uh, we were just starting to reach that period of time uh, during the Great Migration in which a lot of people, black people, were leaving the South, leaving the rural communities to come up North to look for a, a uh, better way of life, better jobs, and, and a means to take care of their families. And so as a lot of them came up to Detroit and other northern cities, uh, what they found was that racism still existed in the North, however, it wasn't necessarily as bad as it was in the South. There were still some issues that needed to be resolved. Uh, housing and redlining was obviously a problem. There was this one doctor who established a practice here in the city of Detroit, and his name was Dr. Ossian Sweet. And after a while of successfully starting a practice and achieving some success, he wanted to do what most people in this position would like to do. We want to provide a better living for his family. So he had the idea that he would buy a nice home uh, over in the city of Detroit. Uh, it was over on Garland Street. And uh, unbeknownst to him, it was an area in which uh, they did not like to have black people moving into the community. There were some concerns that if black people had moved into the neighborhood, uh, people who were just struggling to get by, they would lose uh, property value and their homes wouldn't be worth much and they might find themselves upside down. So there was this organization uh, who mysteriously called themselves the Neighborhood Improvement Association and, and basically what that was was a euphemism for the neighborhood clan and they put word out to Dr. Sweet and to his family that if they did move into this neighborhood, there was going to be trouble. So Dr. Sweet uh, was aware of those uh, concerns, but uh, he steadfastly decided to move his family into that home. They moved in and under the cover of night, they brought additional family members with them. He asked some other friends to accompany him just in case something bad happened. He also had the foresight to bring some long guns, some actual firearms with him just in case. The first night, it wasn't uh, anything remarkable that occurred, but over the course of the next couple of days, there was obviously a great disturbance in the community. Uh, at its apex, uh, one night there was at least 500 people who were gathered out front of his home across the street at an open field. It was quite the sight. There were a lot of people who were demonstrating and yelling and protesting and it got to the point where the law enforcement were called and law enforcement uh, they set up a station down the street they didn't disperse the crowd uh, but they proceeded to watch and it wasn't until the home was actually fired upon and assaulted that Dr. Sweet and other people inside the home returned fire. Uh, when the smoke cleared, the police rushed the home, arrested everyone that was in sight. Uh, one thing to keep in mind back then was that we don't have the uh, constitutional protections that we have today. You didn't have a right to remain silent. You didn't have a right to an attorney. And essentially, they were interrogated for a very protracted period of time, and uh, they were 
uh, charged with murder. Two men who were in that mob were actually killed. So what well, we find ourselves in a very uh, unique set of circumstances when a uh, black man had fired upon a white mob, racist mob, that was uh, assaulting his home. He was uh, in an environment in Detroit at the time which was uh, heavily populated by the Klan. And the Klan had a lot of influence, uh, people of uh, high stature, judges, prosecutors, police officers. So Dr. Sweet found himself on trial for murder back in 1925. And it was essentially the trial of the century. The trial was presided over by Frank Murphy, who for most residents of southeastern Michigan know, his name sits on the courthouse downtown. Frank Murphy later went on to become a uh, Supreme Court Justice of the United States government. Uh, Dr. Ossian Sweet's attorney was the famed uh, lawyer of the day, Clarence Darrell. After a protracted trial at the end of the day, and this was the most astonishing thing, an all-white jury in 1925 acquitted Dr. Sweet of murder. And since the prosecutor said, well, okay, we couldn't get a conviction in this case, we're not going to pursue charges against the other family members, what happened in the aftermath was uh, a typical knee-jerk reaction by the legislature. The fact that a black man could defend himself against a mob, even though they were white but still a mob, racist mob, that was a circumstance that could not be allowed to exist or be possible in the future. So two years later, the state of Michigan legislature crafted the Michigan Firearms Act of 1927, and it was uh, by national standards one of the most draconian set of gun laws that was put on the books. We had the adoption of 83 county gun boards, one for each county. They would have the sole dominion to determine who could get a concealed pistol license, and the criteria varied from county to county, but predictably the result was that if you were in a predominantly black county, you couldn't get one. Another uh, law that was put onto book, to the books was handgun registration. You had to bring your guns, uh, your pistols, into the uh, police stations and have them registered and tracked. That way the government would know who actually owned firearms. And uh, they did a few other things such as uh, they outlawed uh, uh, short barrel long guns to, uh, in effect, prevent them from being concealed. So what essentially what we have here is the embodiment of a national trend that had been going on for several years in which uh, racism manifested itself against the black community and other communities of color through the adoption of gun laws. The very first gun laws that were put on the books in this country were not done in the auspices of firearm safety. It was done as a means of people control. And the way that you can control people is to control their ability to defend themselves, their families, and their homes. So, yeah, it was a very important case here in uh, the city of Detroit back in 1925. So you said some, some of the first gun, gun laws in this country. Are you referring to uh, the gun laws that were enacted uh, right after the Civil War? Or? Right after uh, slavery was uh, abolished in this country, there were numerous laws that were put onto the books to uh, prevent uh, former slaves from engaging in any acts of retribution or score settling against their former masters, their heirs, and their overseers. Uh, they could not own certain guns. In some communities, they, they couldn't own guns at all. In other communities, uh, there were such exorbitant taxes put on those firearms that they, for all purposes and intent, were not affordable by the average laborer. So there have been several uh, instances in which different varying laws were put onto the books with the sole purpose of preventing black people from being able to have arms and to actually defend themselves. So would you say that uh, minorities in particular should be opposed to 
uh, these gun laws. Yeah, in my personal opinion, if the black community was actually taught the history of gun control and realized that it has absolutely nothing to do with, with firearms themselves, I would believe that many of them, just on general principle, would own a gun because it has uh, racist roots. We're talking about gun control. It is nothing to do with safety. It's all about a means of control. And one of the really interesting things about uh, gun control and the way it has uh, changed and morphed over the years is that uh, we don't do a good job of explaining how guns were actually used in the civil rights movement. It was uh, actually the, the presence of guns that actually allowed uh, individuals such as the Deacons for Defense to protect marchers and protesters and uh, lunch counter uh, sit-ins to actually be safe throughout the night so that they could actually protest during the day. It was just a modern uh, phenomenon in which uh, the black community has drifted away towards guns in the aftermath of the uh, adoption of the civil rights movement, but uh, there's absolutely nothing uh, wrong with black people adopting their full uh, benefit of their citizenship, of their birthright as citizens of this country to lawfully own, keep, and bear firearms. Now, I, I don't want to stray too far off topic, but you mentioned the deacons of defense. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate what, what exactly? Yeah, they were an organization of, of black men who uh, took up arms for the benefit of their community. Uh, what you would find is if there were large concentrations of black people on a particular set of town, is that they would be subject to uh, constant threats, uh, people uh, riding through the community, throwing rocks, shooting up homes, burning crosses. Oh, well, this was a group of men, uh, religious men of God, who banded together and took up arms to protect their community. So uh, this is just another instance of where firearms being held in the possession of good people using it to protect themselves and their community. Um, in the political arena today, you hear so much about closing loopholes such as the internet purchases or gun show loopholes. Right. Do you want to address? Yeah, and, and I'm chuckling because there is no internet loophole. Uh, there is no gun show loophole. It's just another instance in which uh, people are preying upon the ignorance of the general populace. It's one of the sad uh, observations of our time today that with this great tool, the internet, that exists out here, you have the ability to go out and summon facts and history and actually do your own research. But as it relates to uh, the internet, uh, it's a lot of talk about an from anti-gun people saying that you can buy a gun over the internet without a background check, and that's totally false. Uh, what happens if I wanted to buy a gun uh, through a uh, third party, through a website, I would buy that firearm, and that firearm would be shipped to a FFL, which is a federal firearms licensee, local to my area, and then I would go to that FFL, that firearms license dealer with the ATF, alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and have a background check before that gun is actually transferred over to me. Uh, gun show loopholes, every person who is a dealer at a gun show is required to be licensed by the federal government, and every gun, regardless of what type of gun, it is, whether it's a handgun, it's a rifle, or a shotgun, it must be, repeat, it must be uh, subject to a background check. What the anti-gun advocates are really talking about, 
they want to ban and outlaw private sales of firearms. And depending on where you're from, what state you're from, what the prevailing laws are, uh, will determine uh, the status of, of uh, the private sales they're trying to regulate. Here in the state of Michigan, all handguns uh, must be purchased through one way or another through a background check. Whether it's a person who does not have a concealed pistol license and they want to uh, buy a gun from a gun shop, the gun shop runs the background check. If they want to transfer a handgun from a family member or for a friend to themselves, they have to get a pistol purchase permit. Uh, by and large, uh, most issues with regards to violent criminals uh, using firearms is being done with handguns. From a numerical, statistical standpoint, uh, the incident of violent crimes being used by criminals with firearms, or excuse me, with shotguns or with rifles is negligible. There are far more people who are killed with knives than shotguns and rifles combined. Far more people killed with blunt instruments such as rocks and fists than rifles and shotguns combined. It's so far off the scale that it's virtually negligible. And when people propose these types of laws and legislations, it doesn't matter what the gun is, it doesn't matter what the statistics are, as long as they can put one more infringement on the books to further restrict law-abiding citizens from exercising their constitutionally recognized right under the Second Amendment to keep and bear arms. And I'll tell you another thing, too, that's also equally uh, disturbing to me uh, is when our politicians are telling us uh, now that if a person is a terrorist, that they should not be allowed to buy a firearm. And I think on its face, I think most people would agree, you know what, maybe terrorists should not have access to firearms. Well, the big issue now becomes, well, exactly who is a terrorist? How do they become a terrorist? Is there some at least uh, modicum of due process involved in this terrorist determination? They say, well, if you're on the no-fly list, you shouldn't buy a gun. The implication is if you're on the no-fly list, you must be a suspected terrorist. Well, the thing about the no-fly list is, well, for one, no one knows that they're even on this no-fly list. And I believe uh, the late Senator Ted Kennedy was on the fly list uh, a number of different times. But we don't know how you get on the list. We don't know how you get off the list. We don't know what you did to merit further scrutiny from the government. However, they're talking about this process by which someone could be arbitrarily put onto a list because maybe they made an uh, unfavorable or unflattery comment on Facebook or some other social media platform. The idea that someone could arbitrarily put you on the list, deny you due process, and then by extension deny you your right to keep bear and own a firearm. To me, it's unconscionable, and to be quite honest, it's un-American. Now, you, you had mentioned the Second Amendment. Uh, many people who support uh, tighter gun laws talk about reasonable gun laws. <laughs> right. And uh, that the Second Amendment was for hunting. Right. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you respond to that? Uh, well, you know, flat out, the Second Amendment is not about hunting. The Second Amendment was given to us by the framers, by the founders, that as a last ditch effort against tyranny, the people would have an opportunity if tyranny appeared to put down that tyrannical government. So yes, uh, law abiding citizens who have no firearms rights, disabilities, should be, on, should be able to own firearms and they should be able to have firearms commensurate on the level of the government so that if we did, hopefully that day never comes, but if we ever did need to do that, it would still be there. And it's not necessarily for us in this current generation, 
there might be generations down the road that might get to that point, but hopefully we don't. Uh, with regards to reasonable legislation, reasonable gun control, we have over 20,000 gun laws on the books, more in sight. There was a group of Michigan uh, representatives in Lansing just a couple of days that uh, introduced another firearms ban, uh, uh, more uh, uh, firearm legislation designed to keep people from owning guns. As a matter of fact, based on the language that they used, it would ban most handguns, rifles, and shotguns that are currently on the market and are the most popular firearms being sold today. I believe also that legislation would make it uh, criminal to actually own those firearms which are currently legal to own today. Uh, when I hear them say reasonable gun laws, they're, they're anything but. We just needed a court to strike down uh, a law in the Mariana Islands. I don't know if you're familiar with the Mariana Islands, but they are a possession of the United States. And they had come up recently with this law that every handgun should be taxed $1,000. Okay, well, obviously, here's that other tax that we talked about earlier in the early days of gun control in this country. Let's make these guns so ridiculously expensive that no one can afford them and basically make it de facto uh, gun banning. And of course the Second Amendment says we cannot ban guns. And it's really interesting because really as we approach this upcoming election, I tell people all the time, guns and gun rights is on the ballot. There's one candidate, uh, Secretary Clinton, she's on the record for saying that she believes that the Supreme Court got Heller and McDonald wrong and that we need to take a look at that. When you look at the Heller and the McDonald decisions, it wasn't about uh, having a concealed carry license. It wasn't about constitutional carry, being able to carry a gun uh, without any uh, register, without any licensing at all. With Heller and McDonald, we're talking about the basic fundamental right to have a gun in your home, okay? And actually in D.C., in the McDonald case, excuse me, in the uh, Heller case, all pistols were outlawed and only long guns could be kept in the home. However, even though it was legal for you to have a rifle or a shotgun, it was a felony to put one round of ammunition into it. So when the federal government, excuse me, when the Supreme Court took up these cases, Heller and McDonald, they say, well, look, come on, you're banning uh, handguns and then you're forbidding them to actually load the gun. For all purposes and intent, you have a gun ban. And so it's unconstitutional, and thus those gun bans in D.C. and in uh, uh, Chicago were struck down. So now we have a candidate that's saying, you know what, we need to uh, take a look at those decisions because I think the Supreme Court got it wrong. It doesn't get any more unreasonable than that. I think that it's uh, your birthright, it's your... Uh, it's your right to be able to own a firearm, if for anything else, to protect yourself, your family, and your home. Hasn't the Supreme Court ruled that the police have no obligation to prevent you from being a victim of crime? That's true. There have been several cases in which that has uh, been discussed. Uh, the one case, uh, Castle Rock versus... Uh, I believe it's Gonzalez. And that's where the Supreme Court stated, no individual person has a right to be free of crime. It is not the police's job to prevent you from being a victim of violent crime. So if the police are not guaranteed to protect you, then the obvious question now becomes, well, whose job is it? And yes, it's really cool where you see the police squad cars and they say to protect and serve. And yes, I do believe that they do their best with the resources that they have. 
But unless if we live in a totalitarian state, the police can't be everywhere and do everything and actually assign individual officers to be bodyguards for every citizen of this country. There is going to be, there's going to be needed uh, a, a uh, motivation for individuals to take on a more active role in their personal protection. So either you're going to assume that duty or you're just going to leave it to chance. Unfortunately, uh, I was robbed 12 years ago in my driveway. And even though I never was deluded into thinking that it was the police job to prevent me from being a crime victim, I was just unaware that it was actually my responsibility and that the Supreme Court had said as much. I thought that that was the, one of the most sobering thoughts that I've ever had, that it is actually my job to prevent bad guys from breaking into my house and assaulting my family. It's my job in case someone tries to carjack me. It's my job to protect uh, the women in my life, to prevent them from being raped. It's my job. And uh, in the aftermath of that, uh, being uh, robbed at gunpoint in my own backyard, it, it's, a, it's a duty that I assumed, and uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. There's no one who is going to be with myself or with my family on an uh, ongoing basis to be there. Uh, I'm the most dedicated person for the task. I can't imagine someone wanting to protect myself more than I do. You know what? It's a sobering decision that was made by the Supreme Court, but I'm up for the challenge, and actually I wouldn't have it any other way. Were you, did your opinion on, on guns and gun laws change before and after uh, being assaulted in your driveway? Um, they did change. Uh, it didn't change from one polar opposite to the other. Uh, my initial uh, feelings about guns and, and owning guns was uh, one of relative ambivalence. I mean, I owned a home. I kept a 12-gauge shotgun just in case I needed it. I never imagined that I would need it, but it was there. Uh, the idea of actually owning a handgun and getting a license to carry it concealed, it never dawned on me. It was just uh, a function of my lifestyle. You know, where I was at that time, uh, the age that I was, uh, late 20s, early 30s, um, family man. I wasn't out, uh, out in the streets. I was at home. I was either at work or at home or tending to, to my family. And uh, when I got robbed, I said, okay, you know what? I need to look into that personal protection thing and I need to get a concealed pistol license and I need to take on a more active role in my personal protection. Okay, uh, real quickly, to kind of wrap up, I just want to touch on, once again, the Second Amendment talked about a well-regulated militia. Absolutely. Um, well, d doesn't that mean that individuals shouldn't be carrying guns? It should well, be part of an organized group? Well, regulated during the, uh, the uh, wording of the time, regulated means trained and the militia. It's not some precursor to the National Guard, the militia was the entire body of the people. All able-bodied people with guns constituted and formed the militia. And I tell you what, that is also a great thing for us to have. A great number of gun owners, approximately 90 million, who own at least one gun, maybe two guns in each home. That is a great deterrent against some foreign invasion or heaven forbid, someone sneak into this country and wants to commit acts of terror on our soil. Okay. Well, with that, we'll conclude our show. And thank you so much, Rick. Thank you for so being much on. for having me, man. Thank I enjoyed you. it. I enjoyed you being here.